Good morning, good Thursday morning, everyone. Uh, well, if you uh, were with me uh, yesterday, uh, you knew there was a little excitement with uh, Constance's brother, my brother-in-law, George, back in Nebraska. Uh, he uh, ha did have some emergency surgery, and uh, it's not COVID-related. He tore his aorta. Wow. Uh, but anyway, he had his surgery yesterday, and he is recovering uh, uh, nicely in the hospital. So for those of you who are kind enough to send your, your well wishes, uh, so far so good with that situation. Today's sort of a special day. I'm, I'm finishing uh, Accidental Christ, the story of Jesus is told uh, by his uncle. Uh, and I'm finishing up, uh, and uh, if you haven't uh, followed along these last few, uh, well, the last month or so, or so uh, I hope you'll you'll scroll down to the page and and uh, listen to the whole thing. Uh, even more, I would hope that uh, if you don't already own a copy of the hardbound, you. Uh, uh, would avail yourself of the of the Kindle edition of Accidental Christ. If you have Kindle Unlimited, it's absolutely free. But anyway, tomorrow we'll be starting. I've decided to start uh, uh, a new book or an old book of mine, uh, which is Angels, uh, Demons, and Gods of the New Millennium. And uh, the, this is uh, the original printing, the original first edition, which was uh, back in 2000, uh, what was it, 2007? Yeah, no, oh my God, 1997. Whoa. But the first edition had this absolutely beautiful, what they call a tip-in, or a, uh, an insert, a fold-out. Uh, this went with the chapter on Demons Are Our Friends. Uh, it was very expensive for them to do, th uh, do that, and uh, in subsequent editions, uh, that table does not appear. But if you'll scroll down in my, uh, uh, my page, I'll be happy to send you the PB uh, PDF uh, uh, file of that chart so that you can, uh, when you get a chance, print it out yourself and tuck it in your copy of the book. The book is still available uh, both in Kindle and on uh, in paperback on Amazon, and I'd hope that you'd want to do that. So the good family news and the, the plug out of the way. I'm going to uh, finish the last chapter, and the last chapter is the epilogue, or excuse me, the, uh, yes, the epilogue of Klopas. If you recall, the book opened with uh, Uncle Klopas's uh, uh, prologue, where he sort of set the stage uh, for uh, the narrative, and today, uh, it's his epilogue. And uh, it starts with an epigram from John. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. That's John 1, verse 11. In the hardbound edition, the rare hardbound edition, there's a beautiful Sumi-e crucifix. Epilogue of Klopas. It is here at this, at a joyous moment in the tale, and remember, he has just raised Lazar from the dead. It was a big moment. It is here at a joyous moment in the tale that I must lay the scroll down 
and stop reading my young friend's narrative. The words upon the page grow faint, and my mind's eye cannot bear the bitter scenes I know must follow. In the author's mind, my memories weave an adventure, an epic story, a great tragedy, perhaps even a, a historical farce. For me, however, my recollections of late seem more like a dream, a tiny dream about a tiny people in a tiny land. Of what effect is such a petty drama to the blazing of the sun or the coursing of the stars? What cosmic consequences could possibly result from my poor nephew's failure to topple a provincial regime, to become king of a nation of myths and dreams? What consequences indeed? I've often heard it said, history will prove this or history will prove that. But history's proof is the most unsubstantial and dangerous dream of all. At this very moment, the words of my dear nephew and the tales of his deeds are being twisted and distorted by a dozen beasts of political intrigue and religious fanaticism. The same interests that undermined the Messiah movement, the same disciples who abandoned him, the same voices that cried for his arrest and crucifixion, the same forces who brought him to the cross and who now, with the most monstrous of intentions, would have him worshipped as a god. Even now, a murderous former agent of Rome, a man who never knew, who never met Jesus, is calling himself apostle and poisoning the minds of even the elect with his hallucinatory gospel of fear and self-loathing. No, history will never be able to tell this story. As much as I laud the literary efforts of my young friend, I confess there are many secrets I have not shared with him. Secrets reserved for members of my family who now dwell near me in this verdant land far from the bloody dust of Palestine. Secrets that God willing, will continue to protect my nephew James and the remnants of his brother's beloved disciples who remain in Jerusalem. It is James now who could rightfully claim the mythical throne of David. But I'm done with plots. I've given my word and I shall keep it. I shall soon carry my secrets to the grave. James must do what he must do without his Uncle Klopas. I've always been a lucky man. I was born into wealth. I married well. I traveled much. I'm well educated in the arts and sciences. I've truly enjoyed my life. My involvement in the Messiah movement has taught me that it's good to have a goal in life, but it's not good to define your life by that goal. Doing so will only guarantee disappointment. All of us are accidental Christs. Thrust awkwardly toward Godhood by factors infinite and unknown. If I would share my secret, I would tell you to welcome your accidental adventures. Enjoy the aimless winging of your soul. 
For in truth, our aimless winging is at once the beginning, the middle, and the end of our journey. And as at the very beginning, we uh, return to a vignette of the crucifixion scene. The thieves yield, yielded up their souls within moments of one another. The centurion and his sergeant watched patiently as the carcasses surrendered the contents of their bowels, then hung limp. The two temple soldiers were visibly shaken by the sight and stood transfixed before the gruesome finale. Joseph of Ramtha and Brother Apollonius moved quickly toward the cross of Jesus and covered the arms with the burial cloth so that witnesses could not see that his hands were not being ripped from nails. Lazar, from atop a ladder, found it impossible to untie the ropes on the left side of the beam and called to Apollonius for a blade to cut them. Before he could respond, the centurion drew his short sword and delivered it up to Lazar, who nervously hacked through the rope before handing the weapon back to its owner. Apollonius hastened to position himself between the centurion and the cross to discourage the Roman scrutiny of the body. Once the feet were freed, Lazar slowly lowered his master's body down from the cross. The centurion ordered his sergeant to remove the other two victims. He executed his task with grim efficiency by detaching the heavy horizontal beams and knocking them forward to the ground. The arms of the victims were still nailed to the planks, so as the bodies flopped forward they fell to the ground with such force that the nailed feet ripped free from the vertical beam. When he was finished, the sergeant sat down for a moment for a swig of water and bragged to the temple soldiers of his distinguished life of carnage. I swear it is true. I've been nine years in the Legion. I've seen thousands of dead men. They will sing to you if you coax them in the gut with your spear. Sometimes if they don't like you, they pass gas through the wound. The older of the two temple soldiers shook his head in disgust. Enough, Roman. The dead are unclean. We do not skewer them for amusement. To your feet. Anatomy class is over. The centurion had little respect for the topic of conversation. Get up, sergeant. Help these men entomb the middle carcass. The sergeant jumped to attention before going to help Lazar and brother Apollonius with the limp body of Jesus. He picked up his spear and turned to the temple soldiers. Watch this, he said with a broad, toothless grin. I'll show you what I mean. And that's the end of Accidental Christ. That's the final Sumi drawing. I hope you've enjoyed this. I've only written what I claim to be two novels and uh, th that's the first one. So I hope you enjoyed and uh, if you'd like to savor it uh, uh, later and see all the little esoteric things that uh, may be nestled in there uh, I hope you get the Kindle edition. But tomorrow we start a new adventure. Angels, demons, and gods of the new millennium. Until then, I'm going to put the phone back on the hook in case I get a call from uh, Brother George. 
in Nebraska. So until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will.